the cloud. All right, Miss Jenny. Okay. Oh, so go ahead and click, click forward. Are we there? <laughs> okay, so, sorry. Well, that's okay. While we're waiting on Jenny, um, just letting <laughs> you know, this training, we've done a kindergarten session last week. We have first and second grade, and assistants have been invited to both. Um, so many of you have joined us with first and second, even if you are a kindergarten assistant. And then we're doing third through fifth next week. And the reason we separated it is because students are at such different places in their learning. So um, we want to combine the EL Achieve strategies that many of us have been trained in, but we also have reading specialists and special ed in the room because we're, we're really looking at language as a whole, which includes reading and writing. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to first uh, recognize uh, who is in the room? We have an incredible amount of ex expertise and teaching experience, probably thousands of years um, in our virtual room. And so we want to learn and collaborate with you. Um, please, as we're presenting today, jump in and share your ideas and your knowledge about certain things. Uh, we want you to be a part of this presentation, not just a... Uh, that's just a listener. Um, so uh, please feel free to interrupt us if you have questions or comments. Um, so first of all, let's see who's here from Dry Hollow. So just unmute and shout out your name and what you do at Dry Hollow. Julietti, first, second grade this year. Kim Myers, title reading and math. Amy Schwartz, Dry Hollow, first grade. Uh, Caitlin Hernandez, Dry Hollow, first grade. Um, Madeline Wetmore, I'm a student teacher at Dry Hollow at second grade. Melissa Hollister, second grade. Marnay Sprouse, Title I assistant. Mia Howell, Title I teacher at Dry Hollow. I just saw Mindy, who's also at Dry Hollow, pop on too. Mindy, you can introduce yourself if you want. Mindy Leonardson, Dry Hollow Elementary, second grade teacher. Awesome, thank you, Dry Hollow. And I'm super, I'm very interested in, in maybe having some feedback from your student teacher at Dry Hollow. I'd like to know from her reading program after we get towards the end, or I think we'd all like to know, some of the things, if she's learning some of the things in um, her program that we're gonna talk about today. Um, okay, uh, next is Mosier, but Mosier I don't think can join us because they teach on Wednesdays during this time. So Colonel Wright. Um, I'm Abigail, I'm first grade at Colonel Wright. And I'm Judy, the other first grade teacher at Colonel, at, yeah, Colonel Wright, of course, that's where we all are, that's why it's our turn. <laughs> I'm Carol Dossett. I'm the principal of Colonel Wright. Jennifer Vott, second grade. Erin Cyphers, title reading. Jocelyn Munoz, a um, ELL assistant. Jasmine, ELL assistant. Eliani Agra, ELD teacher. And by the way, uh, Jenny in the chat, Katie is a Title I assistant, but I believe when she put that, it was for Dry Hollow. Oh, yes, okay. she's at Dry Hollow. So that leads us to Eliani Agra is also going to help us and she's gonna be managing the chat thank and you. also putting some links in there. So thank you, Eliani. Okay, anybody else from Colonel Wright? All right, um, Jenna with Elementary. Nick Anthony, first grade, Chenoweth. Jennifer Tate, second grade, Chenoweth. Kim Sullivan, second. Cindy Kama, my second. Janine Rafferty, first grade, Chenoweth. 
<laughs> sorry, Janine. Amy felt first grade. Sorry, Janine. <laughs> Cassie Lynch, reading uh, reading intervention teacher. Sandra Anderson, Title One reading. Okay, I think we got all Chenoweth. And of course, Maureen and I are from Chenoweth too. And then who is here from our Columbia Gorge ESD? Hey everybody, Scott Whitbeck here. I'm Director of School Improvement. Um, working um, through the ESD, but I'm full-time supporting uh, our school district. So glad to be here. I've, I've seen a few folks when I've joined the 100% and 20% meetings. And um, I'm joining these meetings too, because I'm also learning along with everybody. and. It helps me understand where we all are and what this will help inform our PD plan for next year, which we're getting begin to put together now. So great to see you all here. Thanks, Scott. Okay, thanks everybody. It's so good to see you all. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you, some of you back in the room. And just like Jenny said, especially um, for those who shared their expertise in our kindergarten sessions, or session, please, please, just interrupt because we've even made some changes. We are not experts, right? We're teachers along with you. We just happen to have had some time to go to some conferences and then as a group say, how can we share this information and open a space and a dialogue? Because as teachers, we rarely um, get to come together and share what we're learning and ask questions and ask good questions. There were some kindergarten teachers who asked really good questions that have us thinking about how session two needs to look different. So our essential question, could I have somebody unmute and read? If you can see it on your screen, if not, I'll read it. There are two. How can I best provide explicit language instruction and reading strategies to all of my students? How can I use this knowledge to analyze the instructional language we use in our classrooms? Thank you, Carol. So we're really looking at at the language piece, right, which is why we're here, um, but we all are language teachers. So we're gonna start with a little bit of review of the training that many of you, not all, many have had through EL Achieve. They like to call it bricks and mortar. We're gonna review some of the sentence frames and one of the instructional strategies, explicit in language instruction strategies we're gonna delve into today is sound walls and phonemic awareness. And this is going to be a little bit more heavy on the I do, uh, just because there's a lot of new information. Um, the reading specialist team and our team has been attending RTI conferences and are feeling really excited about taking this work as a, on as a district rather than just kind of in silos. So sorry for talking a little bit more this session than the next one. Um, we are going to look into some wonders, sounds, and words this week together. And then the you do is going to be thinking about next week, um, some of the, the words that you are expecting um, students in your class to learn, thinking about the sounds in particular. We're kind of getting away from, for this session of the sentence frames for the homework piece, okay? So we know that you guys are all really good at that. And then there is one piece of additional homework, which is a choose your own adventure. Um, whether you like podcasts or reading or watching videos, um, doing some of this learning on your own about sound walls, and we'll get more into that. So we are taking a dive into it together. Okay, so the, um, Sarah, go ahead. I was gonna say, hey. Okay, <laughs> so our first activity of the day is we want you to think about one of the most difficult word or words um, that your students deal with when they're trying to read or write. So it's a difficult word. Um, and Eliana is gonna pop in the chat, the website and you go ahead and it's like a wordle, it starts popping up. Um, and even if somebody else already wrote your word, go ahead and write it again because then we see common words um, and you can type in a couple. Oops, sorry, and I'm gonna open that up. Mm -hmm. phone special Wednesday Wednesday <laughs> when who school 
if you see one you like, you can type in more, you, um, and then it'll get bigger as more people type in the same word. Oh, cool. Witness day, yeah. Let's go for maybe 20 more seconds. TH, anything with TH, I love that. Mm hmm. One, wow. Wow. All right, type in your last word, dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a I couple in the chat. Huge Wednesday, Edge, City, EDs, Courage. And there's a ton because English is so crazy. Yeah, so crazy language. We're looking at a lot of words here that have sounds that might not match the sounds that we initially teach students of what a letter says. So it's a perfect transition into why we're here and why we're going to go a little bit deeper than we have at least in the EL world of stopping with just the vocabulary. Um, so if I could have somebody, please, this is much bigger, someone unmute and start with this is review, unless you're new to our district, you have had the EL Achieve systematic um, ELD training. So what is BRICS? BRICS are, someone unmute and read. The vocabulary words and concepts in the sentence. Thank you, Nick. And someone else to read what mortar is. The language that connects, it is specific to the language function. Okay, Thanks, so Bernie. that calls out the language function. So we're always saying, okay, the first thing is you're analyzing what is it that you want kids to do with their language, right? Do you want them to compare and contrast? Do you want them to describe? Do you want them to have sequencing? Um, there are five. Then we say, okay, take it a step back. Now, what language, what words, and what frames, the mortar that connects those bricks, do they need? So you're teaching about animals. And you say, this is a frog, everyone. This is a frog, your turn. Okay, and you're building this together, right? This, a frog has legs, your turn. A frog has legs. A frog has a tongue, your turn. A frog has a tongue. Ooh, a frog has eyes, good. A frog has eyes. Ooh, let's add another big word, amphibian, your turn, amphibian. So you're building this together with your students. Then maybe you say, oh, I really want them to use descriptive words, adjectives. So a frog has big eyes, your turn. A frog has a sticky tongue, yeah. And you're working with words that maybe Wonders has given you, maybe words that you just want your students to use and spell and or say um, correctly. And then you might be building in some verbs as well. Well, where do frogs live? Frogs live in ponds. That's right, frogs live in ponds. And frogs eat bugs, yeah. And so you're continuing to build that language and use visuals. And, and have lots of practice. But then this isn't enough for students to, unless you're a really competent speaker of English, which many of our students are, many are not, but you're missing a piece, right? After you have all of these bricks, you're missing the mortar. So what, how can you put that together? You have your word, your words to choose from, now you need the frame. So a, has, hmm, so a frog has big eyes. Oh, a frog has a sticky tongue. Okay, maybe you start, in, you're working with they. They are green, they live in ponds. So you're really working on building towards students being able to use those frames and have lots of options. 
And the key that we've used and EL Achieve uses as well is color coding verbs red, adjectives green, and nouns blue. So once you've done that, once you've done that, I have a huge critique of this, and we didn't go for this with kindergarten because it's a little less, um, let me go back for a minute, a little less relevant for them, but a huge critique is like this st um, stifles creativity, okay? So we're thinking about that and we're gonna talk about differentiation of this. Um, before we do that in the chat, in your own words, or maybe you could even use a hashtag, how would you describe bricks and mortar? And just write it in the chat. So in your own words, how would you define bricks and mortar? And I'm actually going to put that back up. You can use our exact definition. And Eliani, as they come out in the chat, would you mind reading them out loud? Got it. Hopefully I can keep up. <laughs> so how would you define bricks and mortar in your own words? And or copying. You can plagiarize. That's fine. <laughs> no judgment here. <laughs> Because bricks and mortar is simply an EL Achieve coined term. It's it's not the academic uh -huh. the academic word for this part of our language. Bricks meaning. Uh, first one we have bricks me is meaning, and the mo mortar is communicate the meaning. Love Ooh. it. Bricks are ideas clarified with words. Mortar is the language around the vocabulary idea that strengthens the idea. Beautiful. The building blocks that we use to create meaning in our sentences and the glue that connects them into coherent ideas or thoughts. Glue. Glue, yeah. So mortar is kind of like glue, isn't it? We'll let another one or two, read, maybe read one more Eliani and then I'll, we can read the rest in the chat. Bricks are the new vocab or words pertaining to the new content. M mortar is the glue that holds it together. Perfect. Perfect. Wow, we see, we all have experts in the room. Mm -hmm. So our job is to help students to be able to use their language, right? That's our goal. And we are also developing content, we're developing meaning, all of that is part of our jobs. So with these specific sentence frames, or the mortar, we have a couple goals. And I'd like somebody to unmute and read the first three here. gives students access to the curriculum, meets them at their language level, and provides language support. Thank you, Jennifer. So the, the bricks, right, are what we're saying that there's some of the content or a lot of the content, but then we need to include that, well, how do you do it? How do you make this sound like a co coherent thought or a coherent essay? Um, probably not essay in first and second grade. And characteristics of a really good language support or a language frame are, to have someone else unmute and read these three. They are portable. Portable, flexible, high leverage. Thanks, Caitlin. So what that means is this really gets at the, oh, I don't like Yale Achiever, I don't like the green boxes because it's just like, doesn't work for all my learners. Well, we do not want fill in the blank sentences. That's not helpful to anybody, right? This sentence here is not helpful. Hmm, loves reading at school. There's pretty much one answer. Or Max loves going to, hmm. Like, I mean, that might help one or two students maybe, but really we're looking at how do you make this sentence frame 
be help all the kids in your classroom, maybe the newcomer, I'm thinking of Nikki Anthony's classroom, um, who like the student who's having a really hard time communicating more than a simple subject verb or subject predicate. Um, and then also building towards your native English speakers, like how can you give them options that they can use, they can adapt. So maybe Max reads, Max loves reading at, at school. Max loves reading at home. Sometimes Max likes reading to his mom at home. Okay, so you're really looking at how can I take the simple sentence that maybe Wonders has given you and then add to it in all directions so that all students in your class are benefiting. Okay, and we're going to stop there with some of the EL Achieve specific stuff because we're making a pretty big shift, but it does connect. I promise it connects and Jenny's going to explain how. <laughs> yes, so <laughs> thanks. Uh, no pressure, right? <laughs> um, so uh, this is how um, EL Achieve describes bricks and mortar, but boy, that's super wordy. Um, and it's not, uh, yeah, it's not exactly what we want to focus on today. Um, you might think of EL Achieve as being those green boxes, but really, um, the green boxes are curriculum that were that was created by this EL Achieve in order to help teachers who said, well, your um, processes or your symptoms or your 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 strategies are um, are great and I love them, but I don't have any curriculum to go with them. So they kind of supported uh, teachers with a systematic. But we want to think outside of the green box. We do think there's a lot of things inside the green box that are really beneficial for all learners, but we want to take a step and think like, what can we do to help not only our English language learners uh, learn to read um, proficiently in English, but maybe even some other learners that might um, have some reading deficits. Um, so we want to kind of go outside of the box to, um, to focus on the language. And of course, um, in EL, one of the things that we do in ELD is we will say to kids, if you can say it, they can all say, you can write it. They all know this mantra. And the reason we do that is because we teach them the bricks and the mortar with the hopes of having them be able to um, to figure out uh, maybe how to take that speech to print. Um, and so sound production and being able to correlate sounds with words in print are super important to what we eventually want students to be able to do. Um, but we find that a lot of times there is, we have limited success because like Sarah and Mairead alluded to earlier, we're still, still trying to get kids to read and write better. Um, so uh, this is something that we're going to introduce today is how can we get kids to correlate sound production into, um, into uh, uh, production of their print. So, and we believe that it's oral practice and it's why we're excited about the work that is coming um, in the research on phonemic awareness because we know it will help all of our students in connecting sounds and words to their writing and their reading. And I would just add that Jenny has done a ton of extra work in listening to some of this. And it's not even that we believe what we are learning and um, exploring is that all the science says we go from oral to print. We, have, we haven't found anything yet that discredits that. So we know our brains learn sounds before print. And, and this a little bit of what we want to talk about is um, before Sarah begins in is just that most of our training has not been focused on this. Most of us went to education programs where we were immersed in the whole language approach um, to teaching kids how to read. And the research is showing that that's not working for our students. Um, and so there is kind of a revolution happening um, in the education world and in education programs focus more on a systematic approach to teaching sounds and teaching the correlation of the letters to those sounds and then the correlation of those sounds to print. So it's exciting. Okay, going off of what Jenny was kind of talking about, I'm sure you guys have noticed in your classrooms that 
kids used to come to school with a lot more language and kind of gone are those days, I guess. All students are needing more support, reading, writing, even speaking correctly. Um, and this uh, graphic that should be appearing, <laughs> if you've gone through the systematic ALD training, you've probably seen it because it is from them, but it kind of breaks apart their aspects of language and phonology, morphology, semantics, syntax, and pragmatics. Um, obviously this isn't really including writing, but as you can see, language is very complex and kids can't just pick it up by osmosis, especially um, struggling learners, uh, learners of various languages, um, learners with special needs, the list goes on and on. So we as a village, as we like to say, <laughs> um, are all in this together. And as you can see, a student in their lifetime encounters lots of people, a speech pathologist, maybe a title uh, teacher, principals, classroom teachers, special ed teachers, assistants, English language development teachers. Um, we're all in this together. So the biggest reason we wanted to bring this training to you guys is that, that we are all in this together. And that if we can all kind of be on the same page going in the same direction, then obviously all of our students are gonna benefit. Is it too cheesy to sing that song? We're all in this together. From high school musical. <laughs> One big reading team, getting kids to read, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, I would love volunteers. So if somebody could read the first bullet point on this page, unmute. We are all responsible for teaching and developing phonics and phonemic awareness in all of our students, especially our language learners and students with dyslexia. Thank you, Kim. Yes, our brains are wired for oral language. We have to be taught to read and learn to read. Okay, bullet point number two. I'll take it. How Yay. can we all help all our students learn the phonemes and master phonemic awareness so that they can move into learning graphemes and to reading and writing print? That's the big question here, right? So how can we do that? And we feel that through the research that we've done is symbols. <laughs> There's some really weird graphics in here that I was trying to be kind of like, you know, kind of kitschy with, but I don't know. So the bottom line is that you must understand the linguistics of your native language in order to teach reading and writing to students. The problem is our teacher preparatory programs and classes rarely teach us linguistic, linguistics. I know I took a reading endorsement class, uh, reading, I have my reading endorsement, and um, I think I took one linguistics class, um, and it didn't address actually teaching the sounds um, in our language and how to teach kids to say the sounds, know what their mouth does, what their tongue does, what their throat does, and to then recognize those sounds in print. <laughs> so I find when, one of the things that I do in class is when kids are asking me to spell words for them, if, if I say, I say sound it out, but I also won't give them the letters. I give them the sounds, even if the sounds don't make the sounds in the word. So if I'm saying, you know, uh, eat, I'll say eh, eh, t, eat, because they need to connect the letters with those sounds before they're gonna actually understand that they're gonna come together to make other sounds. So I try to get those basics in because they just, they, they won't even try. Then this, this is point. this is for you, Jennifer, that's amazing. Yeah, you're gonna love this. Sound walls are gonna probably be your strategy going forward, so yeah. right. I, yeah, I cool. think that's a perfect transition, yeah. Jennifer, into the way that we are taught um, that kids learn, right? And then how our language actually works. So this, what we have been, I mean, I would say recently learning for myself, but I know that our reading specialists in the room, this is what they do, which is why as we started combining this work, we're like, wait a minute, we see this in our schools, but we kind of see it in one place. We see it in our reading specialist rooms. So we were taught, and probably most classrooms have a word wall. It's organized, right, by the alphabet. 
And what we're learning is that for our brains to learn language, we go from oral to print. So having it organized by sounds and is going to be much more helpful for students. Now we'll go over how this is could be feel overwhelming right now. The kindergarten best um, comment I think was like, how do you expect me or to do this when I don't want to teach it wrong and then have the reading specialist come in my room and say and like fix all my errors. We are sharing this idea, this research that we have not found like negated yet as a let's explore this as a district because we know this is how kids learn so word walls so we're not saying this is this has to happen <laughs> we're just teachers excited to learn with you so we're they're organized from a to z right alphabetically they're organized by the teacher point of view you learn this word in wonders maybe you put a picture or maybe you just put the word up on your wall um, it goes from print to speech. You're usually looking at it in print and then having kids say it. So it's kind of opposite of how our brains learn. It's dependent on the teacher putting the word up there for kids. It's really focused on the letters, the 26 letters, which we're gonna get into how there are so many more sounds. And they're focused on one word. And it can be super, super confusing with sight words. Like, where are you going to put the word knee? My knee, it, I, I scraped my knee today or no do you know the answer are you going to put that under the k but then kids have just learned kick huh how does that work okay mm -hmm. so the science is starting to say sound walls is where it's at because sound walls are organized by speech sounds so you would have the mm sound you wouldn't just have your letters right you would have an mm sound and every spelling then that would support the N, mm. you'd have GN for gnome, you would have KN for no, you'd have just an N. Now, this isn't something that you would create, you'd be doing it with your students as you find it. So it's a student point of view, it goes from the sound mm, and then to the print instead of the other way. It's independent, once a kid has practiced, um, they could hopefully go to that N, mm. maybe there's a picture of the mouth like you see here, for the sound you're teaching and they could go find what they're looking for and it's really focused on those phonemes the sounds and articulation and then also transferring those skills so we're going to just scratch the surface on what these can look like and what the instruction could look like um, in a classroom whether in its kinder first second really struggling readers across the board uh, why we brought this to you is we've learned for English learners that this is really helpful. And for the session we were in was for students with dyslexia, um, that if this instruction is really strong in the classroom at K-1-2 level of phonemic instruction, that dyslexia, um, for a student with a dyslexia, may not need the interventions they do in later grades. Correct. It is about prevention and um, also only 40% research says only 40% of kids could learn and eat, learn with any method 60% of the students need some level of explicitness, you know, and 20% need it extremely explicitly. So this serves all students, not just students who are having some type of reading difficulty. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you. We are, we actually changed one of the graphics because Sandra helped us see that it was not a good graphic from our last presentation, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, why make the switch? Um, transitioning from word walls or using cards with words on them uh, to sound walls and cards is right for all students, exactly what Sandra was just alluding to. So can I have somebody read the first bullet point that's gonna come up? Just anybody on mute. We very rarely talk about the speech sounds in the English language. Mm -hmm. Next one. Speech sounds are integral to learning to read and write in English. Mm -hmm. Got to know the sounds and be able to read, just like what Jennifer was saying earlier. You got to know those sounds, right? 
Okay. Next one, anyone? Kids learn as they do it, integral to our philosophy of I do, we do, you do. Thank you. Yes. So that is you showing them, the whole group doing it together, and then them being able to do it independently. And the very last one, if somebody could read the very last one. Evidence base that supports the science of reading. Thank you. Yes. And if you just Google the science of reading, um, in, a, in Google, put that in there, you will find so much great information like what Mairead was talking about earlier. This is research that can't be disputed, um, that we learn from uh, speech to print, not print to speech, and that um, science, this, uh, this research is um, definitely been proven to show that kids learn to read better, okay? And this, so you will get this, um, yeah. the PowerPoint Hegarty. slide, this Hegarty blog is linked, but we'll also send an email to you. This is about a teacher who, um, classroom teacher who's like, wow, this was revolutionary and here's how I changed my instruction. Um, and we know that Hegarty is already used in our district. Um, this is just taking it a little bit further. Thanks. And this is one example of what a sound wall could look like. Um, the training we did with, um, I always forget her name. Sandra, you know her name, Dr. Yeah, Carrie yeah. Lee Beck. There we go. Carrie Thomas Carrie Beck. Beck. Carrie, Carrie Thomas, Thomas Beck. Beck. Cause I have, yep. Yeah, so Dr. Carrie Thomas Beck said something a little different than this visual. She said, you always start with the image, the picture, then the sound and you give lots of examples. So this one, if you have a TH sound on the left, those would actually be two separate areas, right? For on your sound wall, you would have the for thumb that has no voice behind it, just air. So if you, you can stay muted, but everyone make a sound. Okay, so if you're teaching that with kids, you would have no vibration in your throat, you'd say. And you'd actually, you might even get close. I, with my newcomer class, I get close and I'm like, look, it's a, that sound doesn't happen in, in um, Spanish. So we really have to practice that. And then feather, we have a th as in there or them, there you have a vibration. If you put your hand on your throat, th you'll feel th the vibration. So actually explicitly starting to call kids attention to this, is gonna help them transfer sounds to print faster. Hmm. We're really running short on time, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, I think, uh, should we just read these ourselves, the next one? Yeah, I like yeah. that. Okay, so take a moment and read. These are some more uh, benefits of sound walls, or do you want me to just read them really quick, Marie? Sure, yeah. Right? Okay, so explicit instruction of phonemes to improve phonemic awareness, builds orthographic mapping, provides consistent review of sounds, provides a visual reference for students in the classroom, and improves spelling. So again, speech to print, very important. And these are some of the major researchers we found. Um, we added some of these based on our last session, but Dr. David Kilpatrick, Louisa Cook Motes, who's this book called Speech to Print, um, the podcasts, you'll have some options to listen to podcasts. Dr. Mary Dahlgren and Dr. Antonio Fierro all have really good stuff out there on this. Okay. Well, really quick, a comment in the chat. ORTI has added y'all do to the gradual release model. This adds in peer scaffolding group practice prior to students being expected to be independent. Exactly. I do, we do, you do. Thank you. I love that. Mm -hmm. OK, I think for lack of time, I think we'll just <laughs> do this quickly. Um, no. So, <laughs> what? I said, did you know, instead of asking, asking them to guess. Yes, did you did know, you know <laughs> how many consonant sounds there are in English? So there are actually 26. In vowel sounds, there are 18. Most teacher prep programs do not teach you these things. Um, although they are very important because, again, if you are going to learn how to write, you have to know all the sounds.
This is Dr. Uh, Mary Dahlgren, and Mairead is going to show a very short clip of her teaching how to do the sound cards with the, um, the vowel sounds in our language and how this helps support our English language learners. Some insight about the vowel sounds of our language. So we start with, again, the tight smile, E, then we begin to open our mouth slightly, E, I, A, E, A, I, A. Did you see how my mouth dropped down? E, I, A, E, A, I, A. That's that doctor sound, A. Ah. That's that what we consider the most open sound. And then we have A, ah, A, uh, O, U, U, and U. Also notice over here, I have two sounds. We call our diphthong sounds. Diphthongs are two movements of the mouth, two. So the DI in diphthong is, means two. It's the same prefix as in digraph. It's that Greek prefix meaning two. So diphthong, oi and ow. Those are what we classify as our two diphthong sounds on our, on our vowel chart. These are a little bit elusive for children because um, they feel like with that two movements, there might be more than one sound. They are spelled with more than one letter. So that makes it pretty easy for students to begin to learn oi, O-I or O-Y, and the owl sound, O-U or O-W. So those are things to, to think about. Why am I teaching you about all these sounds? How come I'm not just teaching you the print? Because when we talk about learning to read and learning to spell, learning to write, even in our spoken language, if I know the sounds, I, I go from speech to print. I learn to speak first, and then I learn how to read. Um, we can be aware of sounds without ever knowing how to spell them or read with them. I want you to think about English language learners. What if they come into your classrooms and they are totally unaware of the sounds in our language? Well, most of us don't just go through an inventory of speech sounds without some type of prompting. So this is your opportunity to learn about the sounds, the vowel sounds in the English language and why sometimes it's so difficult for many of our students to learn them or to learn to spell and read and write in the English language because we have all these sounds, but nobody's ever made it transparent for them. Nobody has ever made it transparent for them. Um, so we're hoping that through sound walls, this explicit way of teaching the sounds include the 18 vowel sounds, including the schwa sound, um, which is that sound that you sometimes get behind words like, uh, in words like banana, buh, buh. You make the U sound like that U sound or ab, about, right? About, you make that sound. Um, so that when you are correctly showing these sounds to students, like some of these consonants and vowels that you're not adding the schwa sound. Sometimes words just naturally add that. Um, but uh, for example, when you're doing the sound T, you just wanna say t, 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 not t, right? Okay, so there are lots of examples of this in uh, the research and in the videos. I think this is Sarah, right? Yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> no. so I had a total brain lapse or whatever. So we're voiceless, <laughs> non-voiceless. <laughs> yes, okay, so this is our example of just the consonants, but you can see the difference between voice to voiceless, the fricatives and the stops. Um, again, it's like Jenny was saying, you wouldn't, um, a lot of times people introduce B as like B or like P. There's a big difference. Um, I'm trying to see the other graphic. It's really small. What? Does anybody want to oh, add? You anything have to click one more. I think. Oh, well, yeah. this is a reminder of don't add the schwa sound to these. The, to you the don't the want oh. Yeah. Perfect. So this is, we're really just scratching the surface, right? And we're not saying, okay, a sound wall should, like, should just appear in every, that's not even our suggestion. We're just saying, this is amazing research. So if we're combining this with the EL Achieve strategy of the bricks and the mortar, how would that look in an actual lesson? Well, after you've, you know, built 
some of this language with your students and then you're saying, okay, it's time to write and you're confused like I have been, especially with some first graders who you look at this, they can say a beautiful sentence. I think they're probably using the pictures and it comes to writing and uh, it will be some like mixed up thing of what's on my board. And I'll say, well, let's try to sound it out. And they might even be able to tell me a few sounds, but it's just so confusing. So maybe with this one, you're like, okay, students, what, how do we describe the tongue? Sticky, ooh, sticky. Remember when we learned that sound k for kite? <gasps> I wonder if you can hear a k sound, k, and without, the, without that schwa, right? Not k, but k. Can you hear k in the word sticky? Is that the beginning? In the middle, the end. You're right, it's in the middle. Let's add sticky, sticky to our sound wall for k. Let's add it under the k sound. And so then you would have both of those words visual there for students. And it could just be, you know, a two, a one minute, 30 second call out of we've already covered the sound k. Here's another example of it. And I would underline the ck in sticky so that, but I, kids could also transfer that skill. Yep, and um, like Marie had said, we don't expect you. I, I mean, you can't. Like, you need obviously. We all need a lot more training on sound walls and how to best um, introduce the sounds in a systematic way. And there is a su suggested uh, scope and sequence for introducing the sounds, um, and they could be matched kind of with your Wonders curriculum. And um, even Wonders has uh, sound cards um, in there, which with actually. Um, you probably have these in your kits that have the little holographic um, uh, mouth on there that shows you how to make the sound. But one thing that you could do right now in your classroom is just really think about when you're introducing a sound or teaching a child about a sound, ask yourself, what are my lips doing? What are my teeth doing? What is my tongue doing? What is my voice doing? How does the air flow out of my mouth? And you can build some, 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 you know, some teaching with your students um, on a sound that you might be working on in your class. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily on a sound wall to begin with until more training is done. But one way is to learn on your own and kind of just maybe talk about uh, the sounds with the students. And then eventually when you do get to thinking about putting a sound wall, maybe at the beginning of the school year after some more training um, on your wall, you just wanna introduce one sound at a time, display the sounds that you've taught. It's not like you start with this big sound wall and then you go to this wall the, and put a word under it. It's as you're, t as you're learning with um, the students and the students are helping to add those words onto your sound wall. Um, I'd like to suggest too, if um, you're not sure you're, if you're not comfortable with really working on the whole visual of it is talk to the speech therapists because this is like I did speech therapy for my my BA so um, all of this stuff is the phonics that we learned yes. um, and so it's it's all about the how your mouth is moving and so they'll have great resources and they have their you do have a few resources like I was saying in those cards but Jennifer you just brought up a, a, a great a, we have so many experts right here and our speech therapist should be your friend when it comes to how to do these things like what my lips and my teeth and my tongue and my voice are doing so awesome thank you for bringing that reminder forward to reach out to those to those people Yes. I also think that it depends on what grade you are, like a second grade class, they could start out the year with having, you know, a good portion of a sound wall built because kids should have learned many of those sounds both in kindergarten and first grade. You're, yeah, you're right. But yeah, but you also want to keep in mind that there are some kids that might not have learned those um, to build those. But that's the one thing with ki kindergarten is they were like, do I teach 44 sounds in the, you know, in, in the kindergarten when I, when I don't really, am I really focused on 44 sounds? No, you focus on the found sounds for your grade, right? So I wouldn't expect a kindergarten classroom to have all 44 sounds on their wall because kindergarten doesn't teach all those sounds right? You teach sounds systematically as you go up through the grades. Uh, one other thing, I don't know if you've read word, Words Their Way 
but they talk about the order that the sounds should be taught in. So that's a really good resource too. Sorry, I, I keep interrupting. In that suggested scope and sequence, I, I can't remember what the sources were for that, but that's great. Can you can you type that uh, source in the chat, Jennifer? Yeah, awesome. I'm just going to put a plug, plug in. There's also a words their way for ELL kids too. Awesome. So what we were hoping to do with this was as a group to go over a word that in wonders you're working on right now, or maybe one that your students are having trouble with and talk about how you would teach that. Um, we are majorly running out of time. So think it in your head. <laughs> <laughs> and the next session, I, we are going to have a lot more time to be in both breakout rooms and just talking. Right. So again, we're running out of time, but <laughs> this is the you do part. And again, this is not a district expectation. We just as a group think that this is very important for all students. Um, so we encourage you to choose a couple words, could be sight words um, or vocab words that you're going to be teaching next week. Um, and think about what sound do you want them to focus on? Um, have you already taught this sound this year? Have you, and if not, or if so, how will you explicitly teach this sound? And what visual will you create to help uh, the students connect the sound to print? So again, the know. example at the bottom there of their sound while yours may look very different. If you know yours, it would be helpful for us to see them in the chat, especially to see what, what students at other schools are expected to learn. I mean, we're all using wonders. So if you know yours right now, type them in the chat. Or even just a couple. Oi, <laughs> boil. Mm -hmm. Oi, and that, yeah, that's a bit. And OI is a big one for English language learners because they would say OE because an I is an E. Yep. Mm hmm. Yeah, I was teaching jump and giraffe, jump giraffe. I was teaching that because we're doing a unit in ELL, Mia, about um, jungle animals and jungle and giraffe have the same beginning sounds. <laughs> so it's like very confusing for those kids. Is it a J or a G? Um, so yes, uh, what training and tools do I need? Um, what are you all interested in? For one thing, you should have these wonder sound cards um, in your materials. If you do not have them, reach out. And I think there are some extra ones kind of floating around the district. Um, actually, Caitlin Hernandez, these are from your old classroom. I took, <laughs> I took these ones from, I'll give them back though, I promise. Um, or might, I might keep them actually, they're really cool. Uh, and then of course, um, Tools for Reading, which is Dr. Mary Dahlgren's um, website for her sound walls, has um, sound cards and you know mirrors and things like that because she really wants you to teach the kids how to see their own mouth in um, as they're making the sound. So, what training and tools do I need? Um, is this me still? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, you now have a choose your own adventure. Um, and you can dig deep into the videos if you're a visual person and like to watch other people um, do this work. Or if you're like me and you drive to work every day and you like to listen to podcasts, um, I would say uh, Ed360 is a fabulous podcast. Um, and it has, it's all about reading. Ed 360 and um, Dr. Mary Dahlgren and Dr. Antonio Fierro, who is an ELL specialist, ELL teacher. Um, and he was an EL, he was an English language learner himself. So uh, they, um, they have a couple, they have one independently that they've each done and then they have one that they've done together. And then of course, um, Hagerty is something that we use here, but Hagerty blog has a sound wall blog. And of course, tools for reading is Dr. Mary Dahlgren's um, and Fierro's website. 
uh, with um, information and tools. And we'll provide all these for you in a follow-up email. So don't feel like you got to write them down. But we um, are, the next session, we are going to start in breakout rooms uh -huh. where you just talk with your colleagues about like, what did I, what's something I learned? What's something I have a question about? What's something I maybe tried and, or like something I didn't try because I think this is really overwhelming, but we are going to start in breakout rooms. Thank you. Oh, yes, and you can also just Google sound balls. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, we did it! We were doing it so thank all you this together. Thank you so much for being here. Um, for some of our reading specialists, thank you for listening to a lot of talk again today. And we do need your feedback. Part of your feedback is requesting some of these materials if you'd like them. So Eliani is putting the Google form in the chat. If you click your chat, click that blue link. It's going to bring you to a Google form to ask you some of your takeaways. And honestly, the more that you put under your thoughts, or especially um, like at the last question, we I promise that we're going to read these and then take that into account for session two. Mm -hmm. So please don't leave until you fill it out. It's kind of your exit ticket, which and is a strategy. And we're using it to make a, an order request with Scott with Beth ah, with some extra ah, funds. Ah. If you want some of these materials and their pictures on the exit ticket with with the materials that you might want in your classroom. And maybe I could just jump in and say, folks, I know sometimes that as educators we're reluctant to ask for anything because we're so conscientious of money, but <clears throat> this is one of those times you do want to speak up if you need them, put it down because. This right now, we're getting a good sneak preview and a chance to practice kind of no risk practice this spring. But in the fall, these would be some of the things that are just standard district wide, we'll all be expected to do. So we want to make sure you have all the supplies that you need so that you know you have you can do the things that you're learning to do and put to use your new expertise. So please don't be shy to speak up if you anything that you need on this. We'll make sure we get it for you. And I want to know I, is the student teacher still yes. online? that was here earlier? No? Okay, because I just wanted to hear if she had learned anything in her teacher prep program about sound walls or anything. Is she with working with you, Melissa? Okay. So yeah, we, would you ask her and find out if she's learned anything in her ed prep program about sound walls? It'd be cool. Um, I, I'm, I just would, I'm a first year teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I just, I was a student teacher at Dry Hollow last year. And um, we didn't learn anything about sound walls. Mm -hmm. um, I went to George Fox um, and we covered a lot of things. We talked about uh, sentence frames, but not like how you just de described it, not at all. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't broken apart like that at all. It was yeah. like we were taught like the bad example you gave, <laughs> like what not to do with them. Um, and I yeah, we haven't, I've never heard of a sound wall. Um, so it sounds pretty great, so. Yeah, awesome. Well, I mean, that's one of the goals of Dr. Dahlgren and Dr. Fierro. Like if you listen to their podcast, the one thing that they say at the very end of the podcast is they're, they want one goal. If they could do one thing to change education, it would be that this information and the science of reading training is in teacher prep programs so that you feel more prepared when you come and you're teaching kids how to read. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, like, I think that, um, that we hopefully could get somebody who's an expert in this area to come in and, and do this training and it would be super powerful and our reading teachers can be the, the catalyst, uh, for that and, and our speech path can be the catalyst and, in, in helping us all learn together because I'm excited about learning how to teach it, teach these things this way. Because I don't know. I never learned this, never learned it at school. And the best so, comment, I, sh I keep saying comments, but another kinder teacher said, I started looking and I couldn't see examples of kinder classrooms. I want to see that. So even typing things like that in the chat mm -hmm. will help our district know what training is wanted or not wanted. If you're like, nope, I got this. <laughs> yeah. And in our chat, we have the survey, but I also added the slide deck, but Maraid emails that out as well. But the slide deck will allow you to have the links in uh, the video that we watched. So if anyone wants to stick around, I don't think we have anything pressing. So you can stick around or you can leave. Just make sure you answer the survey. 
I can play you a song if you want to stay around. <laughs> <laughs> you play that music? <laughs> that Mexican music? And now we're a little geeky. Yeah, the high school musical dance. Yeah, we're all. <laughs> I'm going to stop recording though. Also, Thank my you. students keep telling me, I'm, my students keep telling me,